everyone, and welcome to Through Time and Clades. My name is Joan. And I'm Albert. And today we begin part four of my series, Humanity of Prologue. This time it's called Life on the Open Savannah. And we're going to talk about the Australopithecines. But uh, first things first, Albert, how are things on your end? Oh, I'm doing fairly well. I've been uh, very busy. Uh, I guess I, I keep saying that, but it's true. I've, I've been very busy this, this past month or so. So uh, most recently, I've been taking an online course by a company called Transmitting Science. And it's a course on morphological phylogenetics. So basically using um, anatomical features to infer the uh, evolutionary relationships between different organisms which is uh, what a lot, a lot of my research is focused on. And uh, it was a really helpful course. Um, so we, we learned not only about the, the theory of how to analyze, you know, do, do these kinds of analyses, but also how to use a lot of the software um, that, uh, that does these analyses for us. So um, it, was, uh, it was very helpful. I'm glad I took it. Uh, transmitting science courses uh, are basically this type of uh, focused um, methods-based course uh, for scientists to learn, you know, key um, methods. <laughs> it sounds sounds uh, sounds weird when you say the word too many times, but yeah, uh, key methods that might be uh, useful in their research. And so um, I took this one because obviously it, it's relevant to mine. Uh, they are pretty expensive, so I'm gonna gonna try to have my uh, uh, department cover that. But uh, yeah. It's uh, it was definitely worth it. I think. No, oh, that sounds really exciting. And yeah, if it'll help, then I'd say go for it for sure. Um, yeah, uh, on my end, uh, of course, uh, we delayed this episode a week because mm. I was on vacation. Um, uh, me and my sister were visiting the Outer Banks, and we had our own little beachside adventure, if you will, taking in the the local sights and sounds and tastes because goodness knows there's lots of great restaurants on the uh, the Outer Banks region. But uh, I guess for follow-up, uh, I was able to catch the last two episodes of The Age of Nature, hmm. which I had mentioned previously. And uh, my final verdict, I thought it was great. I thought it was a very wonderful documentary, which gave a lot of really nice hopeful stories about communities around the world helping to rewild places and combat climate change. So... Uh, I believe all three of his episodes should be available now on, on the PBS website mm. if any of you are interested in checking them out. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, I, uh, the, the Tetrapod Zoology Podcast put out a new episode uh, <laughs> earlier today. Yeah, looking forward to listening to that. <laughs> yeah, I listened to it this morning. Cool. And, uh, it's a fun one. I, uh, I was supposed to be in a good place. Very nostalgic. Um, I'm glad Darren and John are still keeping up with it yeah, no matter yeah. how quickly like mm. it, it, it take me on hiatus for a couple months and it comes back and i'm just i'm still excited for it <laughs> as i'm sure a lot of us are yeah right but uh that's usually it on my front so i guess let's go ahead and and, and jump right in sounds good so uh, uh when we first last left our here let me rephrase that when we last left our hominin ancestors uh, way at the very beginning of the Pliocene epoch, uh, you know, they, they were adjusting to environmental pressures that were cooling and drying the world. Uh, the tropical forests were giving way to open woodlands, and hominins were starting to spend more time on the ground while still retaining part of their previous arboreal existence. But uh, as the Pliocene rolled on, new species evolved, and the hominin family tree just grew larger and larger. And it's uh, these members of our family, the Australopithecines, that we're now going to turn to for this episode. So if we could jump into the next slide. Yep. Uh, so the, uh, the Australopithecine represents what's known as a grade of hominins that shares a very similar body plan that would have characterized what the earliest ancestors of the genus Homo would have evolved from. You know, the, they're different enough from species like Sahelanthropus and Ardipithecus but they haven't acquired all the anatomical characteristics to warrant their classification in the same genus as Homo. Mm. So uh, it's, a, it's a term of convenience, you know, which is something that classification does quite a lot. 
uh, but for the series, of course, I, I do want to ensure that I'm sticking to a phylogenetic framework. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is probably where paleoanthropology has had the most trouble. As I mentioned in previous episodes, you know, there's a great schism in the field between lumpers and splitters. Mm -hmm. you know, those who see hominin diversity as a small number of species versus those who see it as a large number of species. Now, as far as the Australopithecines are concerned, there's a curious case of double application here. You have lumpers engaging in splitting and splitters engaged in lumping. Huh. <laughs> so uh, here's what I mean. For a long time now, most species intermediate on the hominin family tree between Ardipithecus and Homo were put into just a single genus called Australopithecus. Now, over time, as more fossils were uncovered, they were usually singled out as a new species and placed in that same genus. Mm -hmm. And many of these authors would argue that their particular species of Australopithecus was more closely related to the genus Homo mm -hmm. than others, often on the basis of just a few features or so. And so when eventually these fossils were plugged into phylogenetic studies, proper ones, indeed, that's what they showed. Uh, a gradual branching of forms before a common ancestry with one or two species of Australopithecus and the genus Homo. So in short, that would mean that Homo directly evolved from Australopithecus. Now, that is absolutely a case study of a paraphyletic genus. Mm -hmm. you know, splitters were seeing many different species of hominins and lumping them into one genus, Australopithecus, while lumpers were only recognizing Australopithecus as the one genus in this hominin grade and putting any species, regardless of what coined a genus they had, were put into that. Now, in phylogenetics, we want to try to avoid that sort of uh, method whenever possible. So thankfully, many paleoanthropologists have coined new genera for many of the old species of Australopithecus that better reflect uh, monophyletic thinking, which is how it should be. So in this series, uh, you might notice many famous hominins now have these different names. Mm -hmm. uh, if you recognize the fossil reconstruction in this really adorable image <laughs> on the left here, uh, that's Lucy's species, mm -hmm. conventionally called Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, but this species isn't closely related with the original holder of that name, mm -hmm. uh, Australopithecus africanus. And so we have to use a different genus, uh, which in this case is Praeanthropus. So it would be Praeanthropus afarensis. Now, uh, initially, uh, one of the first splits away from this paraphyletic group was a recognition of a genus called Paranthropus. So these were known as the so-called robust Australopithecine mm. because they were a bit bulkier in anatomy than the other gracile Australopithecines. Now, uh, for an additional convenience, you know, I'll recognize that division here. I'll talk about the gracile forms first before I jump into the robust forms. So if we could jump to the next slide. Mm -hmm. uh, first up on our parade of hominins is Australopithecus anamensis. Uh, this is the earliest known Australopithecine, and phylogenetically, it seems to be the, the one that was the first to branch off in this part of the tree, uh, although there hasn't yet been a new genus coined for it, hence why I put the, the genus name in quotes here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very poorly known. Uh, I mean, the best fossils are the upper and lower jaws, uh, which you can see a cast of here, as well as these fragments of the, the limb bones. From what we can tell regarding its anatomy, uh, it was not a dramatically different uh, species from earlier hominins. You know, both the forelimbs and the hindlimbs that we have show evidence of an equality in weight bearing. So, you know, this was a species that was comfortable in the trees as well as on the ground, uh, probably engaging in the same sort of extended limb clambering that uh, forms like Australopithecus romulus were doing. So if we can jump to the next slide... Then we have Kenyanthropus platyops. This is the flat-faced man from Kenya. And uh, that certainly points to a noticeable feature of this species. Uh, most of the Australopithecines, as far as we can tell, have what's known as a prognathic jaw, like that of the other great apes. Uh, so the upper and the lower jaw kind of protrude outwards a mm. bit. Uh, Kenyanthropus is interesting because you know that, prognath that prognathism is a lot less prevalent here. Uh, 
this morphology doesn't match any of the other skulls that we know about. And so this led the original discoverers to classify it as a new genus and species. Now, of course, if you can tell from the, the photos here of the type specimen, this skull and the teeth, which is the only evidence that we have, are really, really distorted and mm. made, uh, no doubt by geologic processes. You know, it's a skull with almost everything there, sure, but it's very poorly preserved. Yeah. You know, and, and this has caused some researchers to question whether this sort of flat face is actually an artifact of preservation. And you know, that this isn't just another representative of an already known genus where the skull has just been mashed so much we can't really tell. But uh, we'll just have to kind of wait and see where the verdict goes on that. So uh, let's uh, jump to the next slide mm -hmm. here. Now, it's with Pranthropus afarensis that we really start to see good quality fossils. Mm -hmm. Now, as I've alluded to time and again in this series, this is Lucy's species, uh, the remains of which you can see here at the very right. Now, her story is quite fun, and uh, it's, been, it's been told countless times in all the paleoanthropological literature, mm -hmm. popular books, and what have you. Uh, but for the sake of completeness, I'll just give the TLDR version. So... Uh, this specimen was found in the Awash Valley of Ethiopia by an American anthropologist, Donald Johansson, and his team in 1973. And uh, what was eventually recovered following a period of three weeks was much better than anyone ever anticipated. You know, roughly 40% of the estimated skeleton was found. And this was then the earliest fairly complete skeleton of a hominin ever found. And so, inspired by the party that the team threw following its discovery, uh, during which they had the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, playing on a loop on a video or an audio cassette tape, they nicknamed the specimen Lucy. Hmm. And, the name. and uh, since that time, many of the remains have been found. Uh, they have multiple individuals of various sexes and ages. And uh, it's at this point now that we can really begin to understand hominin evolution following the start of the Pliocene epoch. But uh, aspects of this I'll kind of give later on in this episode. But uh, for now, I would like to draw attention to the specimen immediately to the left of Lucy. Uh, this is Salam, uh, also from Ethiopia, who was discovered in 2000 and described in 2006. This is a juvenile who was only three years old when they died. Hmm. And the, the skeleton is of a pretty fair quality just like lucy but here we actually have more of the skull not to mention that fossils of young australopithecines are not really plentiful to begin with so uh, anything is helpful now two things i want to note with salam one the studies done on the baby teeth show that they have a closer similarity to chimpanzees and the other great apes than to humans like us and so it's been proposed that Pranthropus afarensis, and perhaps other relatives as well, might have had a similar growth rates to chimps than to modern humans. Uh, and, you know, and for chimps, that's on the order of 12 to 15 years or so to mature, mm -hmm. versus Homo sapiens, where it's an average of 25 years to reach full maturity. Mm -hmm. um, two, we actually have Salam's hyoid bone preserved. And uh, what does that say about vocalization then? You know, uh, could Australopithecines talk like we can? Do they have the sort of languages that modern humans have? Well, long story short, no. Uh, the hyoid is very similar to that of great apes, like gorillas and chimps, which means that, I mean, they were almost certainly vocal apes. You know, they could make sounds at various frequencies, but we're still a long way from a human-like language. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's jump to the next slide here. Yep. Uh, before I continue with our hominin parade, I would like to highlight uh, these two very controversial fossils. So uh, first off, on the left, uh, was found at the Bar El Ghazal region of Chad, uh, which makes it the first Australopithecine uncovered from North Central Africa. So that's really cool. Uh, all we have is this 3.58 million year old jaw with teeth. And this apparently was strong enough material for the researchers to at least include it temporarily as a specimen of Pranthropus afarensis. Hmm. 
But uh, then fast forward the following year after its uh, publication, and the same team is now arguing that the jaw was actually quite unique from Afarensis. And so it belongs to a new species, which they coined as, and I hope I'll pronounce this right, uh, Australopithecus barel ghazali. Uh, and since then, there have been further jaws that have been found, which have been used to strengthen their case. And uh, similarly to the right, uh, we have these 3.5 to 3.3 million year old jaws that were uncovered from the Afar region of Ethiopia. Uh, the team that found these bones was led by the Ethiopian paleoanthropologist Johannes Hal Selassie, who uh, you might remember as playing a key role in expanding our understanding of Artipithecus ramidus. Uh, in their 2015 paper, they argued that these remains belong to a new species, uh, which they called Australopithecus diiremida. diiremida. Uh, again, you know, it's a case where the jaws just seem distinct enough from the other hominin remains that we have to warn this classification. Well, currently, it is still an open question as to whether these two fossils truly represent unique species. Mm -hmm. you know, of course, within a single species, there's always variation in form while still retaining key features diagnostic of the population. And when it comes to hominins, you know, we only have a fair sample size of just a handful of species. You know, we don't have enough material to fully compare the remains and run the phylogenetic tests and determine the proper classification. It doesn't help that both of these fossil materials, these proposed species, were contemporaneous with Preanthropus afarensis, which has led some researchers to just lump these specimens into the same species as that. Hmm. So for now, these remains are up in the air, but uh, at the very least, the Chad specimens, so Barella gazi, uh, helped increase the distribution range of the Australopithecines. So that's kind of nice. Um, I mean, it certainly is highly possible that these hominins might have inhabited more of the western parts of Africa, but so far we haven't really found anything. Uh, Albert, what do you think about all of this? I mean, sounds like, as usual, uh, more fossils are needed. <laughs> that is, <laughs> that is often the answer to a lot of these controversies. <laughs> I know it, it's really frustrating too because, like. Hominins in particular are just really bad at this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You know that they don't seem to be fossilizing with as much frequency as other organisms. Um, I, I think about various dinosaurs, for example, that we know about, where we might have fragmentary remains, but we have at least enough of them that we can at least work with and try to run phylogenetic models. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, we have fragmentary remains, but it's just such a small amount of them that it's almost not worth the effort mm -hmm. and so again you have all these folks who are just like oh well these teeth look slightly different from this species and they're more kind of like this species but they're still different enough that we're gonna coin a whole new species for it and it's like i mean sure but uh, that, that could just kind of be debunked relatively quickly mm -hmm. with a really good specimen um yeah i uh i am under the impression that there's probably not as much to these new fossils as we're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if these do turn out to be Pranthipus afarensis. Right. But at the same time, I, I, I would be delighted if these were new species. I mean, that would kind of reveal some really great diversity going on among mm -hmm. hominids. But uh, yeah, more fossils. Just more fossils. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump to the next slide here. Uh, and move on with our hominin parade. Mm. Uh, this one is Preanthropus garhai, uh, which is a possible sister species to Afarensis. Mm. Now, again, not a lot of fossil material. Uh, it's mostly a very fragmentary skull, but uh, given the context of its location in time and uh, alongside other related hominins, uh, we can at least be confident here that this is a unique species that shared the world with at least some of the robust Australopithecines that I mentioned previously. But uh, other than that, we don't really have a lot to go on here. So let's go ahead and jump to the next slide. Yep. But uh, this this guy right here, yeah, mm. uh, this is the one that started it all. Yep. This mm. is Australopithecus africanus. Uh, this was the first fossil of its type ever found uh, by the Australian anthropologist Raymond Dart in 1924. 
you know, this was a South African species. This is the earliest hominin that we know about from this part of the world. Uh, and we do have a lot of really, really good material here, as you can see on the slide. Now, uh, Raymond Dart's particular specimen is the Tong Child, mm -hmm. which you can see above here. Uh, it's a bit of a jarring fossil, uh, I'll be completely honest. I mean, when you when you look at it, I mean, it's another juvenile, kind of like Salam, yep. dying about at age two or three. But here you have the whole endocast of the brain mm -hmm. that's pretty preserved. So you have like this really weird like kid skull, yeah, brain, like a zombie. It's like ooh, <laughs> right. It does make a little bit of the willies. Um, now, since this 1924 find, other fossils have been uncovered. Uh, another one that's really famous, and you can see it below here, uh, that's Mrs. Plez, mm. an adult specimen that was uncovered by South African anthropologists Robert Broom and John Robinson in 1947. Now, this one has a particularly unique history. Uh, the actual fossil had to be put back together mm. because Broom and Robinson liked to use pickaxes and dynamite <laughs> oh. to get bones out of the ground. <laughs> There are actual fragments from the specimen that have never been recovered <laughs> because they literally blew up the skull to get it out of the rock. Um, but at the very least, what they were able to recover afterwards is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a really good skull uh, for its age and time. Uh, and also, the name Mrs. Plens, uh, Mrs. Plez stems from the original classification. So this was not recognized as a species of Australopithecus africanus at the time. Uh, these authors gave it uh, an interesting name, Plesianthropus transvalensis. Hmm. Of course, that's now synonymous with Africanus after further work has been done. Um, and today, there's actually some discourse as to whether Mrs. Plez is actually a Mr. Plez. Hmm. Uh, but I mean, it's just the skull. We don't really have any uh, uh, postcranial anatomy for this particular specimen, hmm. so who's really going to know, right? Uh, now, I, I would like to draw attention to the Littlefoot specimen here at the right, uh, which has been recently dated to 3.67 million years ago. Uh, initially found in 1980 and only recently taken out of the rock matrix in 2017, here is, without a doubt, the best skeleton we have from an Australopithecine. Hmm. I mean, we got a nice helping of ribs, we got a great skull, we have hands with fingers we have feet with toes the whole nine yards and already little foot has told us so much and at the time of our recording there's still a string of new papers that are on the way as these fossils are now being properly studied there's a couple have already been released but we still got plenty more to go hmm. so that's exciting um but th th there's one piece of discourse that i'm pretty sure you know where i'm going with this um <laughs> when little foot was first found there was no attempt to classify it beyond being a possible member of the genus Australopithecus. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have some lumping going on. It's a new fossil, probably Australopithecus, let's call it a day. <laughs> but nowadays, uh, the team behind this discovery, so this is led by the British paleoanthropologist Robert C. Clark, they are now arguing that these fossils are distinct enough from previously known hominins to warrant a new species. <laughs> and here they're calling it Australopithecus prometheus. Kind of a cool name. Yep. But turns out it's not a new name. Uh, back in 1949, uh, Raymond Dart proposed that some skull fragments that he found uh, in a neighboring site to this uh, recent Littlefoot specimen were similar enough, and, well, no, were different enough from what was known. And so he coined the name for these remains, Australopithecus Prometheus. Hmm. So essentially, what Clark and colleagues have done is take the little foot specimen and analyze it and see that well, it's similar enough to these older materials from this close by site and so now they use that name for this hmm. well needless to say this is one of the most recent discourse on lumping versus splitting <laughs> and uh, there's quite a number of researchers who have argued that the specimen truly is a uh, uh, belongs to australopithecus africanus uh, which is what I've kind of chosen to follow here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two anthropologists in particular, uh, Lee Berger and John Hawks, who do some really wonderful work. Uh, they have proposed to make uh, the name Australopithecus Prometheus a nomen nudum, 
uh, which is a taxonomic term for basically a scientific name that lacks a published description, hmm. which means that it really can't be used as a valid name in scientific literature. Um, again, time will tell whether this holds up. But uh, for now, we, uh, we have a really, really lovely specimen that's just teaching us more and more about this phase in our evolution. So let's go ahead and jump to the next slide here. Yep. All right, now uh, we finished the gracile forms, mm. and we're talking about the robust forms. So the members of the genus Paranthropus. So first up, we have Paranthropus ethiopicus, uh, which is the earliest species in this group. Uh, as far as material goes, we only have fragmentary remains of a few skulls and teeth. Uh, there is no postcrania. But what's particularly cool about the skull is that it has a very low dish shape to it. Almost like the skull is near horizontal. Uh, I've always thought that was kind of a neat feature here. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of an orangutan a little bit. Mm. Um, but what you might notice is that that ridge of bone at the top of the skull. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, this is a, a well-known feature of the Paranthropus species. That's what's known as a sagittal crest. Uh, usually animals with these crests use them for the attachment of really big, great chewing muscles. Mm -hmm. Gorillas, for example, uh, they have a very pronounced sagittal crest, which kind of gives them this uh, cone head sort of look, um, which we'll get more to uh, later in this episode. So jumping to the next slide here, yep. uh, we have the slightly younger Paranthropus boisei. Uh, this is the largest member of the robust group. It reaches as tall as uh, 1.37 meters tall. Uh, I mean, which compared to modern humans is still not very big, but you know, what can you do? <laughs> Uh, here, the skull material is a lot better. Um, you can see this beautiful cast where they've been able to kind of fill in some of the missing pieces based on uh, similar fossils. Uh, I mean, these, these really put the robust in robust Australopithecus. Mm. Uh, like, this skull is just massive looking. Yeah. I mean, not only is that sagittal crest very pronounced, you know, they get that really strong lower jaw. Uh, you have these really wide cheekbones and the teeth with these really thick enamel. Uh, which is really, really cool. And, uh, I mean, we do have some postcrania, which has been insightful. In fact, the uh, the humerus, which you can see at the right here, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of discussion about whether this actually belongs to Boise Eye, but if it mm. does, that's the first type of fossil of this species mm. in this part of the body, which can give us some really nice uh, uh, anatomical data. But uh, that remains to be seen. And so on the next slide here, finally... Uh, we have the last species that I'll profile. Uh, this is Paranthropus robustus, uh, the latest in the group, uh, where the fossil material is near fragmentary. Mm. Still, we have some good skulls, which confirm you know the general trends for this clade. We've got the big sagittal crest, the wide cheeks, thick enamel. Uh, incidentally, Robert Broom, who was the anthropologist behind Mrs. Plez, he was also the describer of this species. So uh, you know these were first found back in 1938. So this is sort of uh, the second of these new Australopithecines that were being discovered in Africa, which were uh, really, really kind of unveiling the picture of early human evolution from what was known before. Mm -hmm. So on the next slide here, uh, you know, we have our usual phylogeny here. And given all the lumper and splitter discourse, you know, where do, these, where do all these species actually belong in a phylogenetic context? Well... I have the main consensus right here uh, from the very few studies that have been done. And what do they show? Well, again, uh, Australopithecus anamensis is the first to split off following the speciation of Artipithecus. Uh, and then it seems that either Kenyanthropus platyops or the genus Preanthropus uh, split off next. Uh, results have varied, so I kind of made a little polytony here. Hmm. Uh, then uh, it's also an open question as to whether Australopithecus africanus or the genus Paranthropus splits off next. And so I've made a, a polytony for them as well. But uh, of course, without better remains to include in a phylogenetic study, it's really difficult to tell whether these uh, aforementioned specimens of uh, Borel Ghazali and the uh, Diarimida uh, go anywhere on this tree. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if Prometheus does turn out to be a legitimate species, it's also still an open question as to where it would go on the tree. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that it would still be considered a sister species of Africanus, 
so it would be a, a member of the genus Australopithecus. I guess. Hmm. But uh, who knows? It's a good question. Uh, on the next slide here, uh, we'll discuss the further adaptations to bipedalism hmm. of the sort that modern humans have. Um, but we have to keep in mind before we go forward here that the fossil evidence for Australopithecine pelvises and hind limbs and feet for that matter are very patchy in places. Uh, but even all this evidence uh, can give us some fairly good insights, and they have, uh, and they continue to reveal that this particular configuration towards bipedality was gradual. And so all the various features that characterize our modern upright stance arose at different times, like what I'd mentioned previously in the mm -hmm. last episode. Um, as we saw with early hominins like Ardipithecus rhamnus, uh, the upright walking foot began with the divergent opposable hallux, or big toe, um, even as late as 3.4 million years ago in the uh, Pliocene world of the Australopithecines, there still appear to be hominins with this foot arrangement. Mm. You can see the image above. This is the Bertele foot, which was uncovered in 2009 by Holly Salasi's team, uh, and it demonstrates this. Um, but really all we have is these toe bones here. Uh, with the lack of accompanying remains the, with this fossil, we just don't know if this specimen belongs to an Australopithecine or maybe even a late surviving hominin of the Ardipithecus type, which is not unheard of. I mean, I, I think there's a bit of a mistake in thinking that, you know, oh, you know, we have evidence that a species of a really old body form are still around uh, later in time than they, they than they should be. When it's like, well, wait a minute, <laughs> that happens time. You're right. In biology, I mean, we don't look at coelacanth and think, ooh, look at this weird old arrangement, you know, Oh, that's that's something for the Devonian. That's not for the. For the <laughs> it's like no, it, it, it fits perfectly well because that's it's just it's worked mm -hmm. it's successful. It's worked, so why not, right? <laughs> um, now, uh, w when we do start seeing feet from unmistakable Australopithecines, now we have the hallux aligning with the other toes, and it's no longer opposable. You know, the arches of the feet, however are not as big as in modern humans. That is, they're unpronounced. Uh, and the heel, in contrast, is more human-like. And it hits the ground in the same way that ours does when we walk. Uh, the pelvis and the hind limbs are telling as well. So the femur, or the thigh bone, uh, was attached downwards on the hip, and it rests at an angle towards the knee. Now, uh, in humans, like us, that helps with balance, and it allows us to stand and walk for longer periods than chimp or gorilla can. And the pelvis itself is proportioned much more like ours than uh, the earlier hominins, or to the other great apes for that matter, uh, with the sort of upward pointing wing-like ilia. And this further demonstrates that by uh, the time of the Praeanthropus afarensis specimen, which I have here on the right, uh, this is Cadenumu, uh, you know, and that preserves the hips and legs in such a way that it shows how the muscles may be attached to the body. Uh, sure enough, uh, they have this same sort of arrangement. Mm. In fact, when, when the rib cage and the shoulder blade, or the scapula, uh, were analyzed in the specimen, they found that they were actually less weight-bearing than earlier hominin species. So that's pretty interesting. I mean, we know from Salam and uh, from other specimens that early Australopithecines like Prantipus afarensis must have retained some arboreal habits. Uh, Salam in particular has um, very great ape-like anatomy on some of the parts of the bones that show that they had the sort of tree-climbing uh, weight-bearingness that they share with these more recent species. Mm -hmm. um, but they were definitely going about on open ground more and more, and with greater efficiency. Uh, in fact, uh, an Australopithecine may have been so good at it that their tree-climbing abilities might have been compromised slightly. Hmm. So, uh, Albert, you might remember this. Yes. Uh, there was a curious study from back in 2016 uh, by uh, John Kappelman and colleagues where they analyzed the marks on Lucy's bones and they proposed that she died by falling from a tree. Right. You can see in the, the sequence on the image below, you know, <laughs> they were able to point out kind of how and when each of these bones were broken. So, like, she literally, like, face planted into the ground. Oof which, ooh, that just does not sound like a lot of fun. No. Um, 
I should point out, though, uh, this is not a set-in-stone case. Um, there have been other researchers who have argued that, well, her deceased body might have just been trampled by hoofed animals mm. or something. And so that's what this shows. But still, it's a neat idea. Um, and, it, I mean, it it would make sense given what we know about primates in general. Mm. I mean, as I mentioned in our uh, survey of primate evolution, you know, even gibbons, masters yeah. of the disease, have been known to slam on the ground and break their bones. Right. And miss a branch. So, you know, why not? Why, why wouldn't an Australia at the scene have a bad day and fall from a tree? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, certainly uh, trees are safe places to be in in its uh, in its environment but uh yeah there's some there's some discourse there now on the next slide uh, i would like to point out uh, the best proof that we have mm. for this new and improved bipedality in australopithecine and that's the latoli footprints from tanzania uh, they're dated 3.7 million years ago and generally have been attributed to pranthropus afarensis so this is a case where we have we can actually put bones to the footprints, which is always kind of cool. Now, uh, the original footprints, you know, the ones that everybody knows and loves, uh, those were discovered in 1976 by Mary Leakey, the famous Mary Leakey and colleagues. Mm. And uh, there's an image showing a cast of one of these below. And uh, alongside that, towards the left, I, I have this 3D scan with stress markers on it. And sure enough, you know, they share very close similarities with human footprints. So again, you have the heel striking the ground before the toes make contact. Uh, and again, you can see the arches don't make as much contact with the ground as a, a human footprint. Mm. And the, the spread of the footprints in the larger image, however, this one here at the right, uh, this is from a newly discovered set of tracks uh, from the same region. And this is from 2016. Mm. Now, in, in both cases, uh, the tracks show very competent bipedal walkers. You know, the original Latoli footprints were especially interesting for what they show about possible behavior and anatomy. So, uh, Leakey's team recalled that at least two individuals, uh, possibly three, were walking along an area shared by other animals. So there's footprints from horses and game fowl and uh, maybe a dinotheer or two, hmm. these kind of weird elephant-like animals. Uh the footprints are preserved in a uh, hardened volcanic ash that was mixed with rainwater. And so the Leakey team proposed that this ash was from a nearby volcano that's called Sadaman, that today is now extinct, but was geologically active at about the same time in the past. Uh, but this has been called into question by recent work from a geologist, uh, Natalie Zadisev and colleagues. Uh, so again, we have a nice case of uh, fields converging to solve a problem. Uh, and they showed that the type of volcanic rock, which is known as tuff, uh, that was found at the Latoli site, actually doesn't match the sort of tuff that came from the Sandaman volcano. So <laughs> there actually would have been some other unknown volcanic eruption that made the ash that produced these prints. Hmm. Um, but any, anywho, uh, the tracks definitely show two individuals, uh, one much larger than the other. And as I'll explain very soon, it's been proposed that they represent different sexes. Um, but there's also a curious thing about the larger set of tracks. The impressions are a bit too blurry to have been caused by a single individual. Mm. It was proposed that there may have been a third individual here that was actually stepping into the footprints of the larger individual. Mm. It's kind of a neat thing to think about. You know, it's like you, you bring your kids to the beach You're and right. they want to walk in your footprints. It's fun to think about. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, beyond the fact that there might have been a third individual here, and there's at least two, it, it's free reign for speculation. You know, with, what was the context of this? You know, why were these hominins walking where they were? We don't know. Hmm. We honestly don't know. Um, I mean, there's been many interesting ideas. I, I, I know, I remember... Uh, David Attenborough, uh, I, I think this was the life of mammals. Uh, he was waxing poetic about these. Mm. And he was thinking like, oh, maybe it was a, a couple holding their hands and they were just kind of strolling along enjoying the day. And it's like, mm, maybe, mm. but that might be just kind of projecting our modern ideas of partnership mm. into the distant past. Right. 
my friend, the anthropologist Adam Johnson, you know, he told me a really sensible hypothesis uh, where you have these individuals that were actually running from this obviously erupting volcano. Mm, <laughs> right. Doing ash. You know, it's like, it'd be weird that these things are strolling along and there's a literal volcano that's erupting. <laughs> You'd think there'd be some panic going on here. And so he's argued that the larger individual was actually pulling the smaller one along. Huh. And, uh, if you look at the actual prints, you can kind of see how this works. So the small prints are kind of widely spaced at, 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 in their movement. Mm. While the larger prints are actually sort of neatly in a row. Mm. So you can kind of see like this larger individual pulling the smaller one along and they're kind of stumbling and then trying to find their footing as they're sort of escaping this volcanic eruption. Mm. Um, but again, you know, in the end, we, we'll probably never know for sure the context of this. But you know, I think the sort of hypothesizing is uh, all well and good. Um, Albert, I don't suppose you have any kind of ideas about <laughs> what might be going on here. Uh, no, not not I haven't uh, really come up with any ideas of my own. It's a uh, pretty pretty unlikely that I would have any uh, insight, uh, you know, more uh, more penetrating than people have actually examined these specimens, but. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, that's always worth keeping in mind that interpretations of these trace fossils, you know, there there's a there's a lot of uncertainty there, and uh, it's often very difficult to be entirely sure of what was happening. Sure, and that's totally fair. Um, I was actually just thinking just now. I didn't bother going too deep into this particular aspect, but mm. uh, the fact that there are other animal prints as well right. makes me curious. I, I'd love to see where the direction you know these birds and horses and elephants were going yeah that's true if that can give us some clues mm -hmm. the, you know if, if their movement is sort of erratic like you know like they're running or they're in a panic well, right. then that might, that would make more sense with the idea that you know all these animals were running away yeah you know, from the volcano um yeah I, I guess that is the thing it's like modern animals obviously like they they They'll, they'll run from forest fires and, and other natural disasters. Mm -hmm. So I imagine like a volcano, even if it's just spewing ash, like I, I imagine there'd probably be some panic. Mm -hmm. I mean, do animals recognize that, you know, a volcano equals danger? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure uh, if, uh, if there have been many observations about this. I would expect so, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know for sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Hmm, something to think about for sure. Uh, now let's uh, jump to the next slide here. Uh, okay, <laughs> before I start, uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and apologize for these really crudely drawn figures below. I um, I, I, I could not find a better image for what I wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope it gets the point across for what I'm trying to what, what I'll be talking about in a moment. Uh, and you know, you can't talk about human evolution without talking about sexual characteristics, you know, or our bits. You know, we're we're really weird primates, mm -hmm. and we're also not that different either. Right, you know, it, it seems to be a trend with us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you know, when you look at the bipedal nude human body, you'll notice some particulars when you compare them with other primates you know, who are always nude. You know, I mean, for those of us who produce eggs, you know, the vulva is obscured between the legs. Um, for those of us who produce sperm you know the penis is very pendulous and the mm. testes are just kind of out and present um but i mean that in particular that, that's a thing about anthropoid primates that that's yeah compared to like lemurs and tarsiers like uh, anthropoids are the ones that sort of pioneered that <laughs> that body um but however uh, uh, the human penis is fairly large and it's pretty thick compared with the other apes at least mm. Uh, I mean, even the largest apes today, the gorillas, they are not particularly packing for what you might think, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and when looking at the chest, uh, so breasts are also fairly big and they're fairly fatty too, compared with other apes where, I mean, they're not really noticeable unless they're lactating. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, they, they kind of flatten. But uh, human breasts just kind of remain perky, you know, all throughout adulthood. Um and of course, you know, we have butts. 
you know, with very <laughs> cushy, fatty butts. And uh, I mean, like other apes have butts, but they're not as pronounced as ours. And so therefore the anus is really obscured compared with other primates where, you know, it's just kind of out there in the open and you have to make a decision whether to stare at it or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my sister's cat. It's like, yep, that's, that's your butthole. Right. Cool. <laughs> you know? Um, well, I, uh, I, I mentioned our bipedality for a reason, you know, anthropologists for many decades now, uh, they have debated the origins of this arrangement of sexual characteristics. And, uh, many of them have tied this to our upright posture. Um, I mean, for one example of this discourse, uh, there are very few primates today that actually display their chests openly mm. in the way that we do. Mm. Um, one example that everybody knows is the gelata, which is a kind yeah. of relative to the buffoon um they, they when they're out in the open you know they, they sit on their haunches um and so they have these kind of like these pinkish v patterns uh, on their chests uh, for the females at least um but you know for humans by being bipedal and standing upright our chests are always showing um and, and you know, with breasts in particular which are organs first and foremost for feeding offspring you know these do not appear to be used for sexual purposes among the non-human primates. Mm -hmm. and that's why they're called secondary sexual characteristics. Um, and like, you know, human breasts don't really make themselves prominent anyway until puberty. You know, that's when we reach sexual maturity. So, you know, for another, for another matter, uh, I mean, by standing upright, you know, the human penis now has a means to be just front and center. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not obscured beneath the body, between the legs, like other primates. It's just hanging out, you know? Out and proud. <laughs> so, like, what the hell is going on here? Um, well, there was one really prominent hypothesis that was quite popular for many years, and that was by the American paleoanthropologist Claude Owen Lovejoy. So this is way back in 1981. He laid out this big article, and uh, I have it, of course, in the, uh, the references section for those <laughs> interested. It's uh, open access. Uh where he basically argued that the development of all of these features was tied to a sort of sexual selection acting on these newly upright hominins. Mm. Uh, so to explain, uh, you have these hominins who are expecting and expending more and more energy on reproduction than is actually needed for features like feeding or fleeing from predators, you know, because it's a really great advantage for those giving birth to be able to spend more time in rearing a single offspring than worrying about finding food or running from a lion or whatever. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, being apes, you know, there's always this issue of these sperm producing members of your community coming in and mating with you and then just leaving you with a kid while they go mate with everybody else. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, they'll know when you're ready to mate too because uh, your vulva will swell up and basically announce that you're an estrus. Uh, and you can see how this kind of looks so you see the the two chimpanzees that i've drawn here right uh, the one on the right very pronounced um you know four hands are better than two uh when raising a kid and uh, if you want to keep those extra hands to do all the work of feeding and defending you while you rear your baby so over time uh these egg producing hominins gradually lost this sexual swelling in favor of a hidden estrus uh, hence why a, a vulva today doesn't get all fat and puffy mm. when you're ready to screw somebody, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, sperm producers, they, they seem to like this arrangement better because then it means that you don't have to compete with others for the rights to a mate. You know, uh, if your mate doesn't show that, you know, they're ready to mate, you know, they're, they're ready to have sex, then everybody else is going to be, like, uh, ignoring them. And you can kind of come in and, and take your prize. And uh, so in lockstep, the sperm producers could take care of their mates and give them food and shelter while they rear the young. And so this sort of pair bonding evolved. Hmm. And over time, the sexual characteristics changed too. It could become more appealing to the opposite sexes, which is why, you know, today our breasts are so perky and our penises are so big. Uh, it's because those were selected for. And of course, being upright, it's a lot easier too because all of these features could be easily seen mm -hmm. by uh, the opposite sex. Well, to be perfectly blunt, <laughs> this <laughs> entire hypothesis is absolutely riddled with big gaping holes. 
So, okay, for starters, this whole entire angle of hidden estrus relies on a very big assumption that ancestral hominins shared the sexual swelling of chimpanzees and bonobos. You know, we're close relatives after all, right? Mm. Uh, not so fast. Gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons don't acquire these same swellings. Mm. So then their estrus would be considered hidden too. So, you know, what seems more likely? Four out of five ape clades just independently lost estrus? Or that the chimp lineage developed this form of estrus on its own? Mm. And uh, it seems that the latter might be the case. Uh, perhaps there's a bigger issue here that lies in the assumption that, you know, that a form of monogamy is characteristic of hominins, mm. and that it became sort of the ancestral condition. You know, like the only way that offspring could be cared for is between two parents. Um, but, I mean, as we've already seen, for most primates, child rearing is a social responsibility. Mm. Multiple individuals will look after the young and resources are shared amongst each other. You know, this idea of this lone child-rearing individual who needs protection and care from a, a big, strong, sperm-producing mate it doesn't make any sense in this context. Mm. Not to mention that it flies in the face of what we actually know about sexual selection. You know, it's the ones who can give birth that choose their mates, not the other way around. You know, and on a cultural level, too, you know, the folks who thought this hypothesis was sound uh, essentially now had a means to argue that the the monogamous nuclear family of you know the traditional world you know that had a that's supposed to have this long evolutionary history and was somehow the most natural mm, type of family. right right but you know a nice sweep of the ethnographic and historical literature will show you that this is all baloney mm. i mentioned actual field biology for that matter so now you know how do you explain our showy bits um well, long story short, we don't know for sure. Um, as far as breasts are concerned, it remains highly unlikely that they developed through sexual selection. I mean, the, the idea that boobs are sexy is relatively new mm. in human history. And even then, it's been mostly restricted to the so-called Western societies. Mm. Um, you know, there's a possibility that most of what there was to give our species, you know, such large breasts in the first place was nothing more than uh, a means to be a ready fat reserve. You know, you're evolving in a drying Pliocene Africa, and it makes sense, you know, and to, to have breasts as an extra fat reserve if you're, if you're short on food and resources. And there have been a couple studies that have linked energy, fat storage, and reproductive success among those giving birth. Now, uh, for the human penis, again, it's hard to say as well. Hmm. Uh, you know, just like breasts, the sexual attraction towards penises is not universal in all cultures, or throughout time, for that matter. Uh, so maybe this this length and thickness that is so unique to humans uh, is just nothing more than a development that makes it easier to penetrate the vulva and deliver sperm to the egg. Hmm. I mean, the, the, the length of the penis uh, fits perfectly well with the the birth canal um albert do you uh do you care to comment on this whole mess here uh i i don't think i'm i have much to much of substance to add i guess uh to this specific topic uh certainly um yeah things are things are always a little dicey when discussing uh, origins of sexual behavior and such uh it's it's very easy to project our current kind of um values on onto uh these evolutionary scenarios but uh yeah it's definitely something we have to be careful not to do too much not to overextend and i think uh, this is a very good example of how tricky that can be oh yeah and uh, here here on that you know there's going to be continuing work on this front you know whether we think that you know they're sexy or not our sexual characteristics are you know just as fascinating as those of other animals mm -hmm. We have a, a, a the animal kingdom has a whole menagerie of just weird junk, you know. Uh, we we were talking about uh, duck penises yep. uh, in one of our earlier episodes as an example of this. Um, but you know, is there anything in the fossil record that can lend some evidence for any of these hypotheses? Can can they give us some information? Um, well, 
to date, we do not have any soft tissue impressions of Australopithecus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can't really put a date on when our characteristic breasts and penises evolved. Um, but we at least have some clues as to the overall form of the sexes. Um, by analyzing what fairly complete skeletons are known, we're safe in concluding that Australopithecines had a marked sexual dimorphism. Mm -hmm. So the uh, egg-producing individuals were a lot smaller than the sperm-producers. Um, in earlier species like Preanthropus afarensis, uh, this is especially true. I mean, as you can see here on the image at the left, um, you, you go back to the like, totally footprints, and you can see what I was alluding to. Um, the larger tracks might have been a, a, a sperm producer, while the smaller ones were in a, a live birther. Mm -hmm. um, now compare that to later species like uh, Preanthropus, uh, where it's still present. But it's not as extreme as before. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, what does this mean for sexual evolution? Well, again, it's hard to say. Some authors have looked at this dimorphism uh, compared with other apes. And depending on who you ask, they see similarities with gorillas or with chimpanzees mm -hmm. or even with modern humans. Um, you know, hominins in general, we do lack the big canines that chimpanzees and gorillas have. Mm -hmm which are used uh, in, uh, in, in sexual selection. Um, so whatever kind of male-on-male competition that they have was probably not implemented here. Um, you know, say for the size differences, I mean, there is really not much difference skeletally between the sexes. Mm -hmm. you know, that's why it's been so difficult to tell whether Mrs. Plez is a Mr. Plez, for example. Uh, so for the time being, you know, this case remains open. Uh, you know, uh, it wouldn't be surprising to me if Australopithecines uh, turn out to be more human-like in, in this particular uh, respect. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh but before I move forward, I should mention the, the butt thing. Um, you know, wh why our butts are so cushy. Uh, well, that's just an artifact of bipedal locomotion. Mm -hmm. uh, the muscles inside our rear help with leg movement. You know, when the body shifted upwards, those muscles had to be kind of tweaked a bit. And, you know, coupled with the sort of growth of fat reserves, again, which might be tied to the evolution of human breasts. Um, yeah, we have, we have a tush now. <laughs> so uh, there's that. All right, let, let's, let's move on to the next slide here. All right. Uh, as I've mentioned previously, uh, the world of Australopithecines was one of gradually cooling and drying conditions, you know, but still warm enough to support tropical forests hmm. and uh, open woodlands in some areas. The... Early Australopithecines still inhabited the open woodlands regularly, uh, as evidenced by the environmental data we have from fossils like uh, Afarensis. But later species, and some of these early species as well, definitely seem to inhabit savanna environments more and more. Uh, given the range of fossils known, you know, they probably fancied themselves in many different environments, wooded or otherwise. Um, and the fact that there's this seemingly large radiation of different hominin species compared to previous ages might be reminiscent of a sampling bias. Mm. So, you know, it might not be that uh, savannas open up and then the species just explode. It might be that we're just lacking a lot of fossils from our family tree. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But still, you know, it could just as easily be tied to these environmental changes, you know, this evolution in our, in our lineage. Um, and, you know, th these weren't static changes either. Uh, I think I need to make that clear. Um, in Africa, at least, there seem to have been pulses of change following uh, the millions of years of the Pliocene, which affected the landscape, the vegetation, the sources of fresh water, and the average temperatures. So uh, these uh, periods of wet and dry were common in Africa during this time. Uh, and this has led paleoanthropologists Mark Maslin and Martin Trout to champion this as evidence for what they call uh, the pulsed climate variability hypothesis, hmm. uh, which basically means that you know where these periods shifts from wet Africa to dry Africa and back, uh, encourage a correlating evolution of these many different forms of Australopithecines, which eventually would have led to the beginnings of the Homo lineage. And then of course, you know that would only change when the Pleistocene epoch kickstarted with the advent of the Ice Ages. Uh, that's a story for another time. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, we've gone over the species, we've gone over the climate, we've gone over genitals. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, what were these hominins living off of? You know, what role did they play in their ecosystem? 
Let's go to the next slide here. Back in 1924, when Raymond Dart uncovered the little skull of the Tong child, uh, which was the first fossil of Australopithecus africanus, he had his own ideas about how our earliest ancestors behaved. Uh, so in a 1953 article that he wrote for the International Anthropological and Linguistic Review, which was a journal, uh, he advocated for what he called the predatory transition from ape to man. Hmm. So the Tong child was uncovered alongside a host of other animal remains, like bones and horns. And as early as 1929, Dart was arguing that these were the remains of prey items that the species was eating. Uh, and further fossil finds of Australopithecines only seem to prove this. Now, keep in mind, this is a time before proper taphonomic studies were being conducted. Mm. So if any old bones were just found with another fossil, usually that meant that they were just somehow directly related to each other <laughs> automatically, which is not how things are done nowadays. But uh, here it was the case. Uh, it was proposed that Australopithecines were taking these bones and these antlers and they were using them as weapons for killing prey animals and each other, for that matter. Mm. Um, you know, it paid to be brutal and nasty. Otherwise, you'd be dead. You know, I mean, look at this photo on the right here. Uh, the puncture marks on the eye socks of the mm. Tong Tai. Well, that looks like a perfect example of a fellow Australopithecine taking some antlers and stabbing this poor baby in the eyes, right? Mm. You know, we're, we're killers. And so in this 1953 article... Dart explained what has become known as the killer ape hypothesis. And uh, I'd like to quote for a little bit from this particular article to show you what I'm talking about. <clears throat> the Australopithecine deposits of Tong, Storkfontein, and Majapanskat tell us in this way a consistent, coherent story, not of fruit-eating, forest-loving apes, but of the sanguinarity pursuits and carnivorous habits of proto-men. These were human not merely in having the facial form and dental apparatus of humanity, they were also human in their cave life, in their love of flesh, in hunting wild game to secure meat, and in employing implements, whether wielded or propelled, to kill during hunting, or systematically applied to the cracking of bones and the scraping of meat from them for food. Either these Procustian proto-human folk tore the battered bodies of their quarries apart limb from limb and slaked their thirst with blood, consuming the flesh raw like every other carnivorous beast, or like early man, some of them understood the advantages of fire, as well as the use of missiles and clubs. At any rate, there are no known features on the cultural side other than the deliberate manufacture of tools and the systematic employment of fire that separates these proto-men at the present time from early men. Wow. And so, yeah, that's, that's pretty poetic, isn't it? <laughs> um... These ideas were further explored in the 1961 book that I have here, uh, written by uh, Robert Ardrey, uh, who was a science writer with some anthropological training, so he at least had some authority to talk about this sort of thing. Um, and he called this book African Genesis, which was the literature that really catapulted this killer ape hypothesis into our popular culture. I mean, if you read the opening text from the book alone, it really throws this whole hypothesis out there clear as rain you know this first sentence we were born of risen apes not fallen angels and the apes were armed killers besides uh albert have you seen 2001 the space odyssey yeah yeah so y y you know where i'm going with sure, this right. you know, that, that hypothesis was clearly spelled out in that film mm -hmm. you know in that first sequence right yeah you know, uh, hominins are just one animal in the landscape and uh Next thing you know, this, this of course, the, the, the monolith from, the, from space <laughs> is not seriously considered. But long story short, we get intelligent. And what's the first thing that we do? <laughs> we take some bones and learn, hey, we can kill things and we can kill our rivals. Mm -hmm. And so humanity began in bloodlust. Uh, well, needless to say, this entire premise of the killer ape hypothesis has been thoroughly debunked. Uh, you know, all the supposed evidence for weapon use and, and warfare you know, could be better explained by natural processes of taphonomy. You know, you know, these are hominins that just happen to die in an area where other animals have died, for example. You know, let's mention the, the curious fact of the state of affairs that these hypotheses was coined in. 
I mean, when World War One, World War Two, and the Cold War are on your mind, mm -hmm. I, mean, I imagine it must be a little bit comforting to know that war and death are not these, you know, unburnt things to our history, but have a have been with us from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, while we are certainly capable of great violence, for the vast majority of our time as hominins, you know, warfare and brutality of this sort were near non-existent. You know, in the archaeological record, the earliest evidence of large-scale violence, you know, possible war, is only 14,000 years old, hmm. at least. You know, and, and that was probably tied more to the rise of sedentary living and agriculture hmm. than any natural primate urges that this <laughs> killer ape hypothesis was purporting. Um, you know, more often than not, it turns out, we were more likely to be killed by predators than by each other. Mm -hmm. um, you know, life around our other you know, we, we didn't have any claws, we didn't have any sharp teeth. We only had each other to rely on. It was scary. I mean, Pliocene Africa had a whole host of predatory animals mm -hmm. that could easily overpower us. You know, these little four-foot-tall hominins, right? Um, you got Macaridons, so these are the saber-toothed cats. Mm -hmm. Some of these could grow to over six feet long, you know, like a as big as a lion or a tiger. Um, you know, there, there were other cats as well, panthers and cheetahs. Uh, you had giant bone-crushing hyenas, mm -hmm. certainly not fun. You had wild dogs, you had crocodiles, and you had eagles. Yep. In fact, the, uh, the Tong child, it seems highly likely, was not, you know, stabbed by a heartless fellow in the eyes. It was actually killed by a predatory eagle. Mm -hmm. A bit of redundant. I mean, all eagles are predatory. <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so the marks on the skull here that, that the arrows are pointing to, you know, they do show a strong match for this sort of predation. Um, and the living African crowned eagle in particular yep. does have a reputation for catching and killing monkeys. So I imagine a little baby on Pip would kind of fit into that size range that they were looking for. Right. Of course, I mean, there are cases of eagles attacking larger prey animals. Um, there's the famous Tetsu article, the very first <laughs> one that laid this out. You're right. Still a great read to this day. Mm. Uh, in fact, that's where I learned about this research in the first place. Oh, cool. Which, um, so, yeah, ferocious, weapon-wheeling, warmongering hominins, that, not a chance. Not a chance. But if we go to the next slide here, mm -hmm. we can still ask, you know, what about carnivory? Mm. You know, was this dietary option still possible? I mean, looking at it holistically, all of the great apes are omnivores. Yeah. So it seems highly likely that Australopithecines ate whatever they could, you know, including red meat from small animals. Um, interestingly, one way to find out the diet of fossil animals is to make isotope studies of the teeth that have been preserved and uh, what the evidence, you know, can be found from past meals. And the studies that we do have show that these hominins were mostly eating vegetation mm. of various sorts. In particular, species like Africanus were subsisting on C4 plants. Now, uh, ugh, I've spent quite a bit of time in college classes learning about C4 <laughs> versus C3 plants. You're right. Just to be fair, I'll, I'll give a brief rundown. Uh, the C refers to carbon dioxide. Uh, plants, of course, photosynthesize. They take in carbon dioxide and they release oxygen. Uh, most plants on Earth undergo C3 photosynthesis, where the carbon enters these little microscopic pores called stomata, so they can you know, do their thing. But in that particular process, however, there's a lot of water vapor that gets released out into the open. And you know that can be really dangerous to a plant if the weather just gets really dry or hot at some point during the year. Uh, in those particular types of environments, uh, plants living there have evolved C4 photosynthesis. Um, so think about grasses, mm -hmm. edges, uh, some of the composite flowers like daisies. Um, those are C4 plants. Uh, in, in these species, the chemical processes can be conducted while the stomata are closed. And so this water vapor can't escape as easily. As you might guess, these distinct chemical signatures can be detected on fossil teeth. And when you compare the results with the types of plants known in that lost environment, so the stuff that the paleobotanists are digging up, you can put two and two together. 
and the Australopithecines were eating, at least in part, grasses and related plants. Um, one really great source of food that many paleoanthropologists have discussed are underground storage organs. So in other words, roots, bulbs, and tubers. Mm. Um, some of our most popular vegetable foods today are uh, underground storage organs, you know, potatoes, carrots, onions, ginger. Um, and you know, there is a great diversity of species in Africa today, as well as in the recent past. Um, when we look at the skull and dental anatomy of Australopithecines, and in particular, the, that thick enamel on the teeth, you know, we find that mechanically, these hominins would have been able to handle eating these foods with relative ease. Mm -hmm. you know, certainly a hearty source of food, you know, when grass and other potential food sources are absent during the dry season, all you need to do is dig out some roots and tubers from the ground and bite into those juicy, starchy uh, vegetables, and there you go. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really fascinating area of study. And you can see an example of this below a beautiful sculpture from uh, uh, John Gurchie hmm. showing uh, a paranthropus pulling out some uh, some underground storage organs. Now, one neat example of possible specialization uh, seems to have occurred with paranthropus, incidentally. Uh, now, you recall those big sagittal crests that I was talking about earlier, those wide cheekbones. Well, uh, prior to the current isotope studies that have been done, uh, paleoanthropologists looked at these robust skulls and the thick teeth and wide cheeks and they saw what looked like a hominin that could crack open hard nuts and seeds mm. uh, one species in particular paranthropus boisei uh, was nicknamed the nutcracker man in light of this uh, hypothesis here uh, but nowadays this idea has kind of fallen by the wayside uh, you know when the teeth were examined microscopically well, one, the dental microware didn't show the sorts of marks left by crunching on nuts and seeds. Mm -hmm. And the isotope studies that were done on this uh, genus pointed to a diet of grass more than anything. Um, in fact, more grass than is typical for other uh, Australopithecines. So it, it seems likely that, as funny as this sounds, Paranthropus was a hominin trying to be a horse. <laughs> You know, those tall sagittal crests supporting those big chewing muscles, you know, they were used for grazing. Mm. And, you know, the thick enamel was more than enough to handle these uh, abrasive fibrous plants. Uh, you know, uh, herbivory on grass is a very um, risky venture yeah. if you don't have the, the anatomy built for it. That's why horse teeth are so long and, and like, uh, rodent teeth can uh, constantly regrow, mm. you know. You don't have to worry about losing your teeth because you eat grass all day. Um, but, you know, there is one thing that I, have, I, I on purpose, neglected to mention. The presence of C4 plant isotopes on the teeth doesn't necessarily mean that they were only eating C4 plants mm -hmm. themselves. That could also be a, a trace of herbivorous prey animals and those ones that eat C4 plants and pass that on to the teeth. So what does that mean? Well, let's go to the next slide here. Yep. Well, it's with the Australopithecines, at least, that we see the very first evidence of stone tool technology in the fossil record. So we've made it. We've made it to stone tools. <laughs> um, yeah, what was once a hallmark of the human species, you know, the use of stone tools is not unique to us. Chimps use them, and so do the platyride monkeys, like capuchins. Uh, here's the difference. The uniqueness of our stone tools comes down to crafting. When other primates use stone tools, they're tools of circumstance. And I'm borrowing this term from the anthropologist Candendian Sabatier. Uh, they found, you know, these, these stones are found in nature and they're just simply used for a specific purpose. You know, they find a rock, use the rock, that's it. Hominin stone tools, in direct contrast, they're crafted with intention. Mm -hmm. so these stones are not just found, they're napped and they're chipped to produce the, the shape that we're looking for. And this process of changing the stone is then passed on to other individuals so that actual specific style remains the same throughout the community. And so as you can imagine, in the hominin fossil record, it's relatively easy to know when you have stone tools. Because, well, for one thing, you have um, experimental archaeology, like I talked about at the very first episode. 
you can take the kinds of stones that are used to make these remains and check them yourself and you can compare the the stress signatures on those stones to those found from the fossil remains and you can you can be confident that you know this chipped stone was made deliberately by hand versus natural processes mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's very easy to find uh, these sorts of remains in the in the fossil record. Um, and it seems that the earliest of these were discovered all the way back in 2015. Uh, this is the Lomequian toolkit after the archaeological site of Lomequi 3, which is in Kenya, uh, where they were found. Uh, it consists of just a simple series of nappers. So these are stones that have been chipped with another stone to just sharpen the sides slightly. Um, that, that, that way they can be used as knives or axes for cutting. Now, the age of the tools is what makes them really remarkable. They're 3.3 million years old, which plays it directly into the world of the Australopithecines. Now, the previous oldest known stone tools were attributed to members of our genus, Homo. In fact, some authors went as far as to argue that stone tool use was a synapomorphy of the genus Homo. Mm -hmm. It's always a, a, a tricky thing to do, um, but that's what they had written. So, you know, finding tools like these that were likely produced by another type of hominin that wasn't a member of the genus Homo was pretty exciting and, mm -hmm. and brand new. Um, the big question now is, what species made them? Well, based on the two closest fossil remains to this particular site, we have at least two known contenders, uh, Kenyanthropus platyops and Prathropus afarensis. Uh, the case for the latter being the tool makers is a little bit stronger because we do have potential evidence for stone tool use by this species. And uh, this is what I was leading up to from earlier. Mm. Uh, the site of Dikika in Ethiopia produced some animal bones, and you can see photos of them here in the middle, uh, that have cut marks on them. And uh, the shape and pattern of these cuts uh, closely matches what is produced by stone tools. Again, we're talking about experimental archaeology and forming our knowledge here and when these were dated to 3.39 million years old they were associated thusly with Prathropus afarensis which was a fossil species that was found at that site now if this is the case then we actually have evidence of an australopithecine engaging in carnivory hmm. of napping stone tools and then using them to cut into flesh to receive the good stuff so, of course then the question is you know was this animal hunted or was it scavenged? It's a good question, but that's one for another day. Hmm. The point is, if this match holds strong, then we can confirm then the omnivory of Charlopithecines. You know, it's not just speculation anymore. Hmm. Uh, and in another context, these Lamequian tools would be perfect for digging into the soil to better reach these underground storage organs hmm. and process them. You know, tools can be notoriously multi-purposed after all. <laughs> So, uh, in conclusion, the life and times of Prianthropus and Kenyanthropus and Australopithecus and Paranthropus were remarkably different, but also quite similar to that of earlier Miocene hominins. So they were becoming more and more adapted to obligate bipedalism, they were spending less time in the trees and woodlands, more time out in the open savanna. Uh, trading in a diet of arboreal foods for one of tough, fibrous grasses, roots, and tubers. Uh, they were beginning to produce stone tools and not just use them, but actually craft them from a mental image of what they wanted. Mm. And so ever slowly, our ancestors were becoming more and more human. And it's the human on the next slide that we turn to. Mm. The, the next episode of this series, uh, I want to introduce us finally to the genus Homo. Mm -hmm. So the first true humans, and I'll explain what that means in due time. Uh, we'll meet a few of the earlier members of our lineage, so we'll go through another hominin parade. We'll talk about Homo habilis, for example, uh, and we'll see how they further developed the stone tool technology mm. into what's known as the Old One toolkit. Uh, for the first time uh, in a long time, we'll follow hominins out of the African continent and into the expanse of Eurasia, where some groups actually reached as far as Indonesia. Mm. So they the infamous hobbits, hmm. which are a fascinating story in their own right. Um, and finally, uh, I'd like to tackle the question of collective learning, uh, which was and almost certainly is the defining characteristic 
that turned our human family from a simple member of the local fauna into a powerhouse of culture mm. that would dramatically shape the entire planet. And so from there, uh, acknowledgments, uh, of course, Henry and Alicia, thank you for your contributions. Um, if you want to find updates for our new episodes, since we're now uh, recording again, you can follow us on Twitter at Time and Clades. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, if you're probably watching us on our YouTube page, that's through Time and Clades as well. We have uh, playlists now, so you can follow our individual series in order. Uh, if you have any questions for us, feel free to shoot us an email uh, at uh, timeandclades at gmail.com, whether about the topics on this series or anything else that's on your mind. And as always, references will be posted in the description. And much like the previous episode, there's quite a lot of neat stuff here to read. Um, on that front, Albert, is there anything you'd like to add? Any special announcements? Um, not much, other than the fact that um, our next episode is going to be another news episode. It'll be our november episode oh gosh <laughs> um <laughs> yep and then um after that we'll go back to my bird series for the week afterward so yeah and we're going to talk about stressore oh right? uh, yes that's right <laughs> one of my oh, favorite groups I, I can't wait for that one for sure <laughs> well, right, until next time thank you all for listening and we hope to see you again really soon mm -hmm. that's right take care <laughs>